Okay, well, welcome all. I'm Jose Alvarez, and we decided to wait a few minutes because some classes end right at 6.30. So I'm thrilled to invite two very old friends uh, who represent a good chunk of the women at the International Law Commission. Uh, that is, there are six in the group of 34 at the International Law Commission. So I'll just briefly introduce them, and this will be in the form of a conversation. So hold your questions, and we will have time uh, for those. It'll be a combination of discussing the ILC, what it does or does not do, and also uh, focus, especially because one of our uh, two is a, is a specialist on the study group on sea level rise on that particular issue. So Nilofar Oral is director of the National University of Singapore Center for International Law. Uh, she is... Uh, been an active contributor here one way or the other, especially through the U.S. Institute uh, uh, that I run here on Asia Law. And she is an academic, but she's also a seasoned negotiator of treaties, uh, as well as an international law practitioner. Uh, she has been the co-chair of the ILC's uh, a study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. Uh, she has been legal advisor to the Turkish Foreign Ministry for Law of the Sea, and that's been one of her areas of specialty at the center itself in Singapore. Uh, also has negotiated in climate change. She's a distinguished fellow of the Law of the Sea Institute at Berkeley Law, and of course has lectured there in, in regional law courses on international law, the Rhodes Academy, the Rhodes Academy for the Law of the Sea. Um, she, was, uh, she got her SJD at George Washington University Law School, where I started teaching. Uh, and she's got uh, other degrees from uh, the Pantheon Sorbonne, uh, as well as the University of California. Uh, she has served in every capacity that you can name, in, in especially on oceans, coasts, and coral reefs, the conservation of nature, uh, and the Academy of Environmental Law. She's published widely in this and many other fields, and she's a terrific coordinator uh, and can do this kind of talk in her sleep. Um, so Phoebe Akoa is a professor of law at Queen Mary University. Uh, more importantly, she has been a global visiting professor at New York Law School here not too long ago. Uh, she is an advocate of the high court, uh, has been an advocate of the high court in Kenya. Uh, she's been educated at the University of Nairobi, the University of Oxford. She's previously taught at the University of Bristol. She's held visiting appointments at the University of Lille and Stockholm. Uh, she's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. She has served as counsel before the International Court of Justice, including forthcoming as counsel in the advisory opinion on climate change that some of you may have heard about. She is on the Public International Law Advisory Panel, the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, and the Committee of Legal Experts on the Commission of Small Island States and, and Climate Change and International Law. She was elected to the International Law Commission in 2021. Uh, and I guess I'll start with a little conversation with you, Phoebe, uh, because you have served as the, on the drafting committee of the International Law Commission, so you know about how it chooses its agenda. And its agenda has included a walk through all the Article 38 sources of international law, from treaties to identification of custom to general principles to Jews Kogans. Now it's finishing up with my favorite subject, which is the views of scholars and, uh, and, uh, and judicial opinions. But apart from that, um, just so the folks here know, what's been on the other topics in the current agenda, settlement of disputes to which international organizations are parties, with special rapporteur August Rhenish, prevention and repression of piracy and armed robbery at sea with a special rapporteur Yakumba Sese, and a study group, of course, on sea level rise in relation to international law, which includes, of course, Nilofar Oral as part of that study group, and then a new topic, which is great for my course, which is a topic at the International Law Commission on non-legally binding international agreements. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. International soft law is now in the International Law Commission officially. So I guess we'll start with Phoebe. How do you choose these topics? And I guess, 
Do you think these are representative of the most important issues uh, in the world? Or say anything you want about how the International Law Commission functions, and is it what you expected when you came on board? So just to give a bit of a historical context, um, when the International Law Commission was set up in 1947 after the Charter, of course, much of international law had not been codified. Um, codification is always the last step in any legal system, you know. And so um, there was some codification that had been going on, but it was the work of private scholars in groups such as the International Law Association or the Institute of International Law. But they pursued codification very much as an activist ideal, not really anchored to the needs of states. So when the commission was set up, the idea was generally that it would serve the interests of states. And in the beginning, the topics that were on the commission's agenda, the big topics, were very much topics referred at the initiative of governments. Because unlike the ILA, it was intended to serve those needs. So we have the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, or, or, or actually even the Law of the Sea Conventions, the 58 Conventions. These were all great projects on diplomatic immunity. So they're also feeling that, you know, for much of the period, that's what the Commission did. I think the last big treaty that the Commission produced of the jurisdictional immunity of states and their properties, which is still not in force. So there was some believe that the great codification era was over because much of international law was now codified. And of course, there are competing institutions for codification. There are specialized <laughs> bodies and institutions. And in the statute of the commission, although the general feeling was that the commission would direct um, questions of codification and progressive development, it wasn't really intended as a closed topic that that's all it could do. Its main role was also advisory to the political organs. And so increasingly, back to your question, was fewer and fewer topics are referred to the commission by states. I think Nullifer's topic on sea level rise remains an exception. Many of the topics on the commission's agenda now are the commission's own invention, but they are intended to fill gaps. Um, essentially, if you think about some of the topics the commission has taken on board, questions on reservation to treaties, uh, amplifying topics the Commission had already completed, guidelines uh, in relation to reservations, and also questions including subsequent agreements and subsequent practice, which are not necessarily treaties, which was a topic the Commission completed. And so some of these methodological topics, there is a feeling that they are also necessary to keep the law alive, to amplify difficulties that have arisen in the application of the law, and that the commission is the best place. So that's why you see chronologically, the commission has taken in the full gamut of topics in Article 38, from identification of custom in law to, to general principles of international law. Of course, the treaty-related topics have included reservations, provisional application of treaties, in a way of providing guidance to states in relation to particular questions or difficulties that have arisen in the application of the main body of rules. So increasingly, fewer topics. I think the Commission would probably like more topics to come from, the uh, from states to give that necessary democratic legitimacy. But I think there is a competition from other eras. And some of these that the Commission had taken on, we feel, were also very worthwhile exercises in the application of rules. But I don't know if I may want to say something. Do you want to say something about the choice of topics? or? Who proposed the sea level rise exactly? Um, well, um, yeah, the choice of topics, um, first of all, uh, it's great to be here. So thank you, Jose, for the uh, invitation. And it's really nice to be with your class and, and hopefully be able to talk a little bit about the commission. I don't know how familiar they are. I know you've taught them to some degree. Well, you try, um, but then. Yeah, but you have to come and visit us. And I know I have one assistant here, Chris. <laughs> he, he knows how the commission is, so. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, it really, it's, we're celebrating our 75th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So 75 years, and of course in 75 years, things have changed. Uh, and as Phoebe was saying, it used to be that the, the, the topics were, one was they did a survey, 
So two or three surveys have been done looking at what are the topics right for codification. What do we mean by codification? That means where there's sufficient state practice, um, customary international law that now can be codified, turned into a treaty. Um, so, so they took, they did a survey of that. There's a list, and as Phoebe was saying, there was this period everyone talks about the golden era of codification. But they did a lot of codifying. They did their job. That came from the General Assembly, from states. The Commission, and I think this is where, one area where we have lost that external request, and I'm going to get to your question as well, where it has been more self-propagated, uh, where now the Commission, not even looking at the list, the survey, instead the Commission members will come and they will propose topics to the Commission, but not just any topic, there are criteria to be filled. So after a long hiatus of not having anything um, from states or the General Assembly, um, the topic, sea level rise in relation to international law, it was generated by states, one, indirectly, and two, directly. So indirectly, I think one of the topics that is not taught in international law, international relations, is the election system at the UN. So to become an international, you really want to get into that? <laughs> international uh, uh, law commission, you have to be elected by the members of the General Assembly. It's the same for the ICJ as well. So there's a campaigning process. You know, you sit in the UN and uh, with the with the flag, and you meet with the election officers. So during that process, um, what when I started, and probably when also when you were. This topic came up quite a bit from small island developing states because sea level rise is such a critical issue for everyone, but really for the small island developing states. We have Bryce here as well as the legal counsel of AOSIS knows as well. So during the campaign, that would come up with the commission, you know, take on this topic. Um, and they brought this up in other fora as well. I happen to be studying that topic as it was. Um, uh, because of the law of the sea and climate change. Um, so when we were, uh, uh, this was in 2016, 2017, I was elected with a group of others, my other co-chairs. Mm -hmm. And so it so happened that there was a, a group of us who thought, yes, let's take this topic on. And, but what happened at the same time, um, a, a, a written request, came from the Federated States of Micronesia, requesting that the commission take up this topic of sea level rise and international law. And that was the first time, actually, from directly from a state, even though the statute does allow it. Usually in the past, it's come from the General Assembly. Um, so that was the first time we know of that it came directly from a state. And so that made it added more, uh, I would say, a heightened importance to it. Um, and so very quickly, I mean, the commission members understood immediately the importance of the topic, and that's how it started. And that's the first time. First time. Which is mind-boggling when you really think yeah, about it that. Yeah, it is. And it's, I don't know why. I mean, states could come more to the international advice. Because it's been, in the past, it was the General Assembly, all these treaties were at the request of the General Assembly. Um, and I know there's one instance where there was a request um, for the commission to advise on the definition of aggression. Mm -hmm. you know, but that stopped. You know, right. Suddenly, I don't know. <laughs> so um, maybe you want to explain why the commission, and maybe you've partly done this, have stopped generally, except for the crimes against humanity, which you can mention, proposing treaties but alternatives, everything from guidelines to studies uh, to draft articles. Um, that's not a question of the topics, or maybe, Phoebe, you're suggesting it's related to the kinds of topics that we end up with this stuff, including you're, you're in a study group. That sounds like a PhD dissertation, <laughs> right? And so, you know, if you had to ask me what the International Law Commission does, I wouldn't have guessed it forms a little study group. Um, and I'll ask you at the end what happens after the study group. But, but can you say a bit about 
why the output is no longer treaties. Is it just a, we're done with treaties, a treaty congestion, it's all over? So I think, to be honest, the, main, the statute of the commission has never really worked as was intended. It's never been amended, but it's never worked. You know, it, it proclaims that it's, the commission has a statutory mandate to get involved in processes of codification and progressive development of the law. And, and as Nulifa said, you know, codification presupposes that there's a body of practice out there to be systematized and developed and codified. And it became very clear from the beginning when the commission was set up, if you're going to codify, whose practice are you going to codify? The, the new states that came up in the after the processes of decolonization immediately challenged this and say the perceived universality of international law was actually just going to entrench the European hegemony on which it was based. So the commission has never really been involved in any, the processes of codification have always involved progressive development because mm -hmm. there was a challenge. And, and progressive development as in lawmaking from scratch has also never taken place because the commission has Lacks a democratic mandate unless given by the GA to make law from the beginning. So the idea of the twin parallel projects of codification and progressive development in practice has never worked that way. All topics in the commission involve elements of both. Now, in terms of what, why are the commission's outputs increasingly um, reports of a study group or guidelines or uh, or conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, certain topics, the feeling was just that are more suited for a draft treaty. There's a gap. So in relation to crimes against humanity, for instance, the key crimes or the core crimes have already been codified. Even the Rome Statute builds on a substantive law, either developed in the Geneva Conventions of 1949. If you're talking about war crimes, there was already a codified basis for that. The, the definition of genocide which has very much stood the test of time, bills on the Genocide Convention of 1948. So really, um, if you talk about, you know, and torture is defined in a, in a convention anyway. So there was already a perceived gap that crimes against humanity, which is really a creature of judicial lawmaking, was difficult to grasp and what were its elements, what goes into it. And if you're talking about if you're codifying criminal, you need that element of certainty because we're talking about a code that will be applied in domestic criminal processes. International tribunals, as, ever, you, know, as you know, are default courts. They only come into play if national legal systems are, are not working. And if you're going to prosecute for crimes against humanity, you need that those crimes be defined with some degree of certainty. So there, it becomes quite clear that what you want, what is suitable, is a draft treaty which maybe member states can then convene a diplomatic conference to amplify the limits of. So, so that's why certain are we, topics... Are we going to get one? Well, that's in the hands of the Sixth Committee. Um, oh, how careful you are. Um, you know, once the Commission has completed the project, we joke that the Sixth Committee is actually the graveyard of the Commission's projects, because if they don't take it up, that's what, that, there's not that's much else you can do. Say that. Sorry? The council, the UN Legal Council, that was his saying. The graveyard yeah, of Miguel, treaties. Yeah. yeah, well, isn't it really consensus? No, the, is the graveyard, graveyard of the commission. Of the commission. Of the commission. Or commission's projects. Yeah. The commission. the commission. But is it really the problem of <laughs> well, consensus yeah. rule in the sixth committee? Yeah, yeah. This would, we yeah. would really have one if it came out of the third committee, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, to follow up on the question, um, um, because it is that's, that's, that's talked about a lot, discussed a lot, um, but in terms of why the codification process, I don't think treaty making itself has declined. It's still alive, but the topics have changed. So when in the 650s and 60s, and the last one, of course, was the Rome Statute, um, it was much more what we would call traditional topics of international law diplomatic immunity, constant relations, but we know international law has become much more specialized. Environmental law, um, um, space law. So the real question is, is the commission have the capacity to undertake codification of specialized areas like, inter like international environmental law, 
for example, climate change? No. <laughs> I would tell you, no. And part of it, I think, is that reason, that it, it is a commission that was really built upon generalism, general international law. Mm. And so, and, and to be quite honest, um, and I think it really isn't equipped for specialized areas, um, uh, unless they're going to bring in um, general principles of, of general international law, like state responsibility and that. So instead, what the commission has done is that you have this body of codification, now maybe less codification of progressive development or progressive development in a different way through interpretation. So a lot of this work, guidelines, conclusions, the commission is really interpreting even what it's done in the past. Mm -hmm. Use Kogan's was very interesting because it took peremptory norms. It took a topic that had already been you know, <coughs> uh, undertaken by the Vienna Convention on the Law of Trees and the Articles on State Responsibility, but kind of interpreted it a little bit more. So maybe you could look at it that way as well. Um, but they're all guidance or authoritative statements as an expert body for states to use. And I think that they're still, even though it's not the treaties that were once made, it's still very useful. I mean, I think in that sense, one of the big questions for the commission is re retaining its relevancy. Mm -hmm. And so I think even though these are soft law or everything we do is soft law, frankly, because we're not an international lawmaking body. Um, but they're still relied upon, even when they're incomplete, like the, um, um, uh, I mean, even I have to say the, the reports of the study group have been used, I know. Um, so it's a question that, you know, we keep asking, but mm -hmm. I think about that aspect as well, that international law has become much more specialized as well. Right. So I never thought of the generalists as an as a issue. Uh, connected to the, the, the treaty topics. Now, I've looked into the statute and all that. I missed the manual that told me what the difference is between conclusions, draft articles, guidelines, studies. Is there a difference that is consistent across these things? Why pick one versus the other? We flip a coin. No. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Madam Chair um, of the I, Drafting Committee. And <laughs> I should add Madam Morales is on her second time, so she has more experience. But when members have introduced these topics, they have then justified, or, and as, as I said in my time in the Commission, all the topics we're dealing with have been topics that have been introduced on the Commission's agenda at the initiative of members. Mm -hmm. And part of the justification is what would this be the end product of this? Um, usually, of course, there is marked reticence in going down the treaty route, especially when either it's a new topic or when you've not been asked, and, and in some ways anticipating the necessary fallout from either the Sixth Committee that, you know, you don't have the, that democratic mandate, especially in relation to really contentious topics in which there's no political consensus. So when members introduce these topics, they almost always are required to state what they anticipate the end product to be. And it's a suggestion to the commission to consider why guidelines would be more useful or why the conclusions of the commission would be more useful on that particular topic. And essentially, members themselves would respond to that initiative by the special rapporteur and say, you know, we had a lot of converse conversations actually on the non-binding agreements on what the anticipated end product would be. And some members were saying, well, guidelines would provide the necessary guidelines. Um, and others felt that maybe guidelines would be seen as being too prescriptive. Hmm. Why not just say conclusions and let developments in state practice um, take shape on the basis of those conclusions without indicating either way. So those are the kind of conversations that uh, I've observed. But I uh, know if maybe you've, you've been there longer and observed longer <laughs> conversations, but certainly non-binding agreements, that was a very much a live topic. Uh, even at the beginning of the discussion. Yes, and on piracy as well, piracy and armed robbery at sea, that was also a very live conversation on what would be the final outcome. And if it was going to be a treaty, was that going to be an amendment of UNCLOS? And can you, you know, so and have they resolved what that would be? Um, I think it's not been resolved, not least because well, there's going to be a new special rapporteur who may well take the commission yeah. in a new direction. The last one resigned. But, but that was originally started as draft articles. 
uh, and the ISO. So that the piracy was intended to be a set of draft articles and possibly could be a treaty, um, not amending UNCLOS, but kind of on a different level, um, uh, a separate issue, more mutual legal assistance and, and cooperation on that. But this is a, I mean, right now the commission has been grappling with this, it's asked, um, and there, there, I think we're going to be trying to, there's the manual, a handbook, there will be a handbook coming out. <laughs> I thought you heard about it. <laughs> um, oh, is this at the tail end of the re uh, latest report yeah, where you're talking yeah, about reforms yeah, to the procedures? Yeah, and looking at really, I think the idea is, um, yeah, our, our dear colleague Charles uh, Jalo, he was, um, um, chairing um, a committee on this and again what's a guideline to, so maybe you can ask the students how would you define what a conclusion is versus a guideline versus what else do we have um, studies like fragmentation oh the study I'll so explain the, the study the study the study group we have guidelines conclusions um, draft articles draft, well, draft articles and um, principles we also have principles principles right. as well so before we, we go into like uh, sea level rise, can you say something about the composition of the ILC? Um, is it okay? Is it really geographically representative? We know that it's not gender representative necessarily. Um, so what about the election process? Who's on the commission? Who should be on it? Is it, is it biased north, south, any of that stuff? Um, and, and the videotape, it will only be for my class, so feel free to be candid. <laughs> well, I think you can be candid because you've been candid about this. <laughs> you know, apart from the substantive topics, the one topic in Nulifa and I agree on consistently, and all the women in the commission, <laughs> is a question of, uh, it's a standing item on every coffee meeting we have, every lunch, it's a question of composition and what we can do to get more women on the commission. So from the beginning, the commission was, you know, intended to be a subsidiary organ of the GA and therefore geographically representative, that's in the statute. And states have done everything in their power to make sure the statute has been amended successively to reflect the geographical, the changing geographical composition of the United Nations. So as members increased, new states became independent. But it's 34, just about the right It number. is 34 now. I think yeah. the original start, was 15. It started, it started off at 15, twice it was amended because the membership of the General Assembly was increasing, and I think the last one was in the 1980s when it went to 34. Mm -hmm. um, and, and is that about right? Sure. And, and how it is, though, is this because what we have, for example, the ICJ doesn't, um, is in a set geographic representation. So from the Wayal group, which is the Western Europe and other countries, which includes Turkey, by the way, eight members, Africa is... Uh, Africa nine now, but nine. it rotates. It rotates one. with the Eastern European, which is three, or could be four. Pacific Asia is um, eight. eight. And that also rotates. Yeah, and that rotates as well. So it, it's based on the UN regions uh, mm -hmm. and that. Um, it's probably, I think, fair. You know. And how about the process? The, the, the process. election process. The campaign. Oh, the campaign, yeah. I, I do. I really think someone should do... Uh, well, they've done it with selecting international <laughs> judges, and it isn't pretty. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, the, the campaign process. Um, it's really... So, this is the ILC, these representative bodies. Um, the ILC, I mean, the way it's set up is to be representative, at least geographically. Gender is a whole other issue. Um, so, when you look at it on paper, the problem is this, is that are there certain states that have an entitlement to be elected to the commission and the P5, for example? Mm -hmm. um, and I think where it is not fair is that there are certain states that have never been on the commission. Mm -hmm. um, and there are certain states that are always on the commission. Um, so how do we address that? Uh, and I think that applies to other elected bodies of the of the UN as well. Um, so in that sense, I think there's <laughs> need to increase rotation um, and support uh, for states who are smaller states. Um, for example, we have for the first time a member from Mongolia. Yeah. 
Um, we have for the first time when I was elected from Vietnam. This is important, these first time elections. Um, so I think um, that the gender, of course, when I was um, in my first um, term, um, we were celebrating then our 70th anniversary. We were at the UN in New York and we had a side event. And the title of the side event was Seven Women in 70 Years. And everyone, you didn't have to say anything else. <laughs> Pretty well said it. You all. beat the ICJ. <laughs> yeah, but, the ICJ yeah, better. <laughs> yeah, no, that. Um, and and the sad part is, is that the first woman was elected in two thousand and one. Uh, Ma uh, Judge Shue and Paula um, Escarmia, they started together, I believe. Um, but the first woman nominated was in the seventies from Nicaragua, hmm. actually. 60, 60, okay, 60s, yeah. Um, and, and Phoebe can, can continue on uh, on this as well, but but it's been, but the problem is is that the, the statute doesn't provide for you know, gender parity, but even if it did, it's up to the state, individual states to nominate. Um, so how do you impose that on the state that they have to nominate, you know, gender parity, whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, Phoebe, you can so I, yeah, I think it's a complicated process in the sense, like any system where you have an accountable power, that's where you end up with what you see in, a, in ILC or in ICC, or not ICC, less so ICJ. Essentially, these are all posts to which you're nominated um, by government and elected by government through a political process. So most states don't have any procedures or processes for transparent processes for um, nomination. In fact, Nulifa was talking about the PCA that most of their members are men who are also nominated onto those bodies. So what you end up is a situation where a very a process which you can't challenge is not transparent. We don't know who, why, who's nominated. And the election process itself, the election to UN bodies, not just the ILC or ICJ, has become so politicized. So, so much so that states trade votes. So this, the consequences are twofold. One, women have been excluded. I mean, Nulifa knows, for instance, in the ILC, it's not just that there are 11 women, or there have been 11 women since in almost 75 years. Only 29 women have been nominated. But in the same period, 758 men have been nominated. Now, of course, to have a chance at being elected, you have to have to be nominated. But there are also concerns whether or not a body of technical experts, which is what the commission was intended, and to supplement and advise a political body like the Sixth Committee, has ended up replicating the political processes that, that, that have dominated the discourse in the Sixth Committee, so that qualities of legal expertise become maybe, for some, and less relevant than qualities of statesmanship. And there are those who feel that those qualities of diploma is much less relevant in a technical legal body such as the International Law Commission. But e as long as you have a political process of nomination and election with no filters or processes of accountability or challenge, those are the twin problems. One is the gender question, which keeps replicating itself at each election. In fact, one study even showed that even once nominated, women have a, a much lesser chance of being elected. And there were statistics in an, an article in the European Journal. And, and also, there are those who are concerned that the composition of the commission increasingly has headed at certain periods. I haven't looked at the statistics in one direction, so much so that you have a lot of legal advisors, diplomats, and that if that composition is re replicating what is in the Sixth Committee, then the, the commission becomes less of the technical body that it's supposed to be, giving independent advice to political bodies. So um, obviously, there are ways out of this. One simple one is to amend the statute. After all, the statute is just a, a resolution, adopted by a resolution of the GA. And it's been amended to allow for geographical representation. But that's not happened. And, and, and of course, this is a conversation we've had. This raises questions about questions of legitimacy of, of that body. If, you know, a large chunk of the world population don't even have a chance of being elected to it. So describe a little bit the relationship with states, because I know that at various points, you all in your various projects have to consult with states and also get reactions, and then reactions in the Sixth Committee. Um, 
how does that work? Is there an organized system that, and, and what I have seen, at least from a distance, is that in, even in the Sixth Committee, there is very uneven attention mm. to the IOC's work products, mm. where, where the biggest states with the most lawyers seem to pay a lot of attention to at least the issues they care about. But I don't see that huge kind of interest in everything that you do, and I'm curious whether in your consultations with states, even on sea level rise, you see a serious look at what you are producing even in the study group. Yeah. Um, so this is something that is obviously important uh, matter for the commission, because the commission is not, um, I say it's not an academic body. Uh, it's not scholarship that they're doing. It's really um, laying out the foundation for international law making. Um, that is how it's created. So for the commission, what becomes very important is the state practice, comments from the states, getting the states' views. Some even will say that the states, the six committees are client. I'm not sure quite that's the case, but, but so it really is um, integral, that relationship between um, the members of the commission and the states, and that is through the sixth committee, which is the legal committee of the General Assembly. So the way it works is we don't, um, the, the formal way is the special rapporteurs will write a report, or we also, uh, co-chairs have a, write a report. And right now we're in, Phoebe and I are here, uh, not just for this lecture, but because right now the um, UN uh, Sixth Committee, the legal advisors are meeting. And this is the week and next week when they will comment on the work of the commission. And that work usually will be the reports. So that's one important, this is very important for us to hear what the states are thinking about our work. Now, that doesn't necessarily create practice per se. Sometimes it might, might be evidence. Uh, first from the study group, as, as I will explain. Also, in um, the reports, if you look at the reports, often we'll ask for, directly ask states to please send us what your laws, your court decisions, what your practice uh, on certain topics. Because again, that constitutes uh, what you call the meat and potatoes, the bread butter uh, of the work of the commission. Now, as you rightly said, uh, Jose, unfortunately, the not all states will respond at the same level. And there are different reasons for that. One, of course, if you're a rich state, it's easier. You've got the, 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 the legal staff, even they are stretched. But the smaller states, the small missions, some of these missions have just a few people. Mm -hmm. And our reports are massive, to be quite honest. It's not just one topic. Mm -hmm. How many do we have right now? Eight? Mm -hmm. Six? Eight? I mean, the, the agenda of the commission is really a heavy agenda. And the average, I would say the average length of reports like 80, 100 pages. They're mm -hmm. just, I think we just write too much, frankly. But, but it is. It, it is. So, so already these missions are busy. Then you have the very, you know, dense, and there are really dense reports of the commission, um, limited staff. So this is a hindrance, and, and how we get around that, we're talking about that, the ways to do that. Um, so there might be also the topics are not as interesting, but sea level rise is a topic that generated broad interest, to be quite honest. Um, and that's because one, so what's interesting, and Bryce is here, to me one of the most important aspects of sea level rise for the commission is the role of the small island states, particularly small island. They're not all developing states, but these are traditionally the states who would not necessarily have the biggest voice in the UN, not necessarily always be so um, proactive or seen and heard, and, and yet they are the ones who really brought this. So it's an example of where it's the exception to where you have Maybe the more like the EU. EU is always going to be saying something. You know, you know they're they're very vocal. Uh, but the, the sea level rise has been different in that sense, where there's been um, it was started by the small island states and generated comments. So now we have 
a lot of comments, but not from everyone, though. There's still some states we would like to hear from. But it's an issue um, because we really need to have the inclusion of all states. And I know, you know, Danae is doing a very interesting, Danae Azaria is doing a very interesting study on the silence of states. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions comes up is that how do you interpret states that don't respond, that don't say anything? You know, what does that mean? Does that mean they, they agree? Or, so, so these are the issues that we also have to grapple with, is you know, how, um, uh, how to interpret uh, states that don't respond. Um, but we need to have the states. So that is the most important way that we communicate, other than perhaps informally. We, now we're trying to do um, uh, online, that's something that the pandemic taught us we could do, is have online sessions with uh, states to explain them the work we're doing. Do you want to comment? Anything? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything Nulifa says, and this is a huge problem. Essentially, the structural inequalities within the international system of the United Nations very much replicate themselves in the work of the Commission. So the Commission has to show and is expected to show deference to states. In fact, we wait for those comments and respond, adjust the text appropriately, taking on board the comments received from states. And guess what? Who are the states who are going to respond? A handful of we all states. I remember when I was chairing the drafting committee being really disappointed uh, on the topic of immunity from foreign criminal jurisdiction, which is a matter that had exercised African states for so long that you would expect them to have taken a greater interest to ensure that the product of the commission will reflect those concerns. But I think only two states, Sierra Leone and, and, and those, the, those were even oral statements in the Sixth Committee, made statements on the topic. Mm. And so that, in a sense, has huge implications for, for the rule of law. What, what will be the text that comes out of this if it's a reflection of, of state practice? Or, you know, it will, be, it will be a handful of states who responded, and it's not necessarily representative and some of those concerns were well, they will tell you that we have one legal officer we just don't have time to read the commission's work we have only so many lawyers in the ministry of foreign affairs i know because i took an interest in this in in having conversations with with lawyers in in the ministry of foreign affairs in nairobi and just saying well this is coming up if you don't respond to anything you know so so those are some of the structural <coughs> issues and and for me it, it, it it's a bit worrying when the final product reflects the view of the commission having taken on board reactions of states. They are very legitimate questions mm -hmm. about which states were, how representative were those, were those bodies. Um, so in this group are probably some uh, would-be applicants to be clerks uh, uh, on your ILC. <laughs> and so I'll ask for them what makes for a good intern or clerk. You have uh, NYU regularly sending, yeah. I think, I don't know how many, 10, 12 sometimes, Benedict? Uh, seven. Um, so what makes for a good intern, and, uh, and, and what's your advice to them? So I've been very lucky, and I think I've heard, my, well, I was hoping to see them, you've had some excellent assistance. And when the assistants come to the commission, like us, members of the commission, I mean, I've, I've been on the commission for two years, you don't get much advance notice of what's going to be on the agenda. You, you may, if you're very curious, you can look on the commission's website. But much of what is to be discussed really never gets distributed that much in advance. So the good interns are the ones who are genuinely curious and are ready to read and learn quite fast. Um, a, a sound understanding of the techniques the general methods, processes of lawmaking and international law, a very deep sounding of that. And really, generally, a holistic view of how the commission works is quite useful because in terms of the detailed topics which we have to respond to as members of the commission, because you'll be working with either me or any one of the other 34 others, um, you'll be expected to, to take on board a lot of information and be able to assist in responding to it at very short notice. So. What I find the best ones are those who had sound understanding of, of techniques of general public international law and a certain curiosity about the topics on the commissions and agenda and, and also a willingness to, 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 to jump into the deep end of what you didn't know mm -hmm. and come up by Monday with some understanding. Of, but um, yeah, Geneva is great and I think most of the assistants are 
I hope enjoyed or I don't know what feedback you get back, but <laughs> we've certainly been very pleased to have them. So let's go into sea level rise. So you divided up the topic into protection of persons, law of the sea, and the impact on statehood. Each one is a formidable agenda. So what made you choose those three? And, if, and I know your specialty is law of the sea, so you may want to take a few stabs at what you think is significant uh, on the portion of the show that dealt with law of the sea. Do you want to say that? Something? All right. Uh, so yes, um, as I said, we, we, we established a study group. Um, and we've had a couple of study groups at the commission before. The famous fragmentation of international law is probably um, one of the best known. Um, and the reason um, we decided to go with the study group is almost like why not draft articles versus conclusions, um, was to give states more comfort. Um, they were concerned, particularly in the law of the sea, um, that we would try and engage in codification, i.e. meaning amendment. So, um, and then on the other issues, protection of persons, statehood, these were, it's hard to think right now, or b because right now everyone's talking about, within a short period of time, it's become, everyone's well versed. But at that time, generally speaking, and, the, and among states, these were still somewhat, um, I wanna say exotic topics to some degree. Um, so a study group would give a kind of a comfort to states that we're not going to engage in anything radical codification, uh, but we would be doing a mapping exercise, a mapping exercise of what the law provides, what state practices, what's missing. So that's all in the syllabus. And we were five at the beginning, now we're three. Um, and I think that also gave us some flexibility as well uh, to do more exploration uh, in the topics. Now we weren't the first though, International Law Association. They had already been working on it, and we were a bit parallel. They also had the Law of the Sea, um, the uh, Protection of Persons, Human Rights, Statehood. Um, so it was similar. Um, and I think those are looking at the broad issues. Neither one, however, and this has been brought up, looked at the environmental issues. So that's mm -hmm. missing. Mm -hmm. um, we expressly were, were excluded liability issues. Um, and again, we're dealing with states. You have to have, you know, states have to be a comfort. Because when we selected the topic, uh, as I say, at that time, we had the small island developing states who were in favor. But the other states, it wasn't that clear. In fact, the, in 2017-18, we've studied this now, there was ambivalence. Some there were a few states that were not didn't want us to do it. Um, some states were supportive, but there was kind of a bit of ambivalence. That's changed a lot during this time period. Um, so the study group, I think, made everyone comfortable uh, as, as to what we're doing. We picked those topics. Those were kind of e the topics that seemed um, at that point uh, most pertinent and relevant. Um, uh, for the work we were doing. On the law of the sea side, the issues concerned, well, so sea levels are rising, and I don't know how much you're following sea level rise, uh, the science, but the science has told us, they tell us, and there's, it's with high certainty, I mean really, there's basically no doubt that we're locked into sea level rise, not for 10 years, 20 years, but centuries of sea level rise. That's happening, that's gonna happen. Uh, it's just a question of how much. Well, that means, what does that mean? Well, the sea, what's going to happen to the land territory? It's going to become submerged, that land territory. And if you've taken the law of the sea, that has a direct implication for maritime zones. And so the question became, well, does that mean that states have to change their baselines? Does that mean maritime boundaries will change? I'm sim simplifying. Well, no one knew, there was no answer. Scholars, of course, were very good at creating issues. <laughs> they started saying, oh, baselines are ambulatory. Now that means that they, these all have to um, move landward, and what does that mean? Um, so this was important, uh, became a very important issue. 
Um, and so that's what you know we've been looking at. And I have to say again, I have to keep pointing out to Bryce here, who should be sitting with us, I think, um, the work of the Pacific Islands Forum, AOSIS, he's a legal counsel on. Um, they have really, really also been a very strong force in bringing clarity to the issues relating to baselines, maritime boundaries, and now what pretty well I think there's general acceptance is that, um, no, sea level rise doesn't mean you have to change your baselines um, and, and, and favoring the notion of preservation of existing maritime rights, maritime entitlements, and, and it goes, and this will probably go on into statehood as well, the notion of preservation of statehood. Um, so this was all a process, it took time, not a lot though, I think we did, we, it's been quite quick. Um, one issue, of course, is the status of islands, mm -hmm. which is a tricky thing, but you know, the law of the seas is, is if, you, if you're an island that can um, sustain human habitation and economic life of its own, um, you get EEZs, you get everything. Um, but if you're a rock, that means you can't sustain human habitation or economic life. You're, you only get a territorial sea. So that's a big difference. All right, so the question then is, can an island become a rock? Never, you know, I don't know. Um, so, so these were really, you know, questions with very serious Now that particular one intersects law of the sea and your statehood. Yeah. And you haven't reached an answer to that, whereas I, I think with baselines, yeah. you've said in the law of the sea portion, your original baseline stay the same, yeah. even if you're completely submerged, which suggests a presumption that a state is always a state. Right? Well, we got me. I think that has changed too. Now you hear states are all saying the continuity of statehood. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pretty clear the message coming out is we've gone beyond presumption even um, that uh, sea level rise will not cause the loss of statehood. It goes more into the issues of how will you know how will you govern with that land territory but I think we're at the point now that once a state at least for purposes of sea level rise always a state you know and I would say once an island always an island you don't lose those rights do you want to comment on yes that? just very quickly I mean I was not there when the topic was taken on board but I have to say what I have always found very problematic about this is the commission's reticence to take on the questions of statehood and questions of identity and continuity of statehood, states, which has been on the commission's agenda since 1949. So this, in some ways, has brought it to the fore, that what, what are the implications of statehood when some of the physical characteristics disappear? I think we started very much in the discussion as a starting point, the Montevideo criteria. There's also the question of implications of self-determination as an enduring principle, but what are its implications if the territorial base on which it's anchored no, is no longer in existence? I think, in my view, the Commission probably should have the political courage to take on these topics. But we have. No, no, I'm talking about the whole question of statehood outside the context oh. of sea level oh, rise, oh, oh, right? So because. So are you saying that taking it up by sea level rise is the tail is wagging a very big dog here? Yeah. And you're afraid of the consequences of what Nullifer is doing on statehood, or no? I think I'm just not afraid. I think the, the, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not concerned. As I I'm, I'm just worried whether or not this can be comprehensively dealt with without dealing with these larger questions. In a sense, you are, the, the sea level rise has ring fence the ambit of how far they could go. But to me, the bigger question is, the whole law on state identity but and continuity. I have to say, I guess I don't quite understand because now in the statehood topic, mm -hmm. um, basically it's saying, well, Montevideo is limited um, and, and that it's about creation and even that it's not exhaustive, mm -hmm. but there's nothing about loss. Mm -hmm. And it also brings in self-determination. Uh, that has been uh, uh, very much um, uh, amplified and confirmed permanent sovereignty over natural resources. So it's bringing up, you know, the sanctity of boundaries. It's bringing up all these issues. So I guess I'm asking Phoebe. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement, but I'm just saying <laughs> what that, is it that the law on all these questions 
which have raised so many problems in so many different areas, have never been comprehensively tackled. And in a sense, the Commission is asked to take on the concepts of sea level rise and address the questions of statehood, when the larger questions of statehood have never really been proved. There's no codification anywhere on the law on self-determination, despite if, if one of the Commission's role is to codify that law, we don't have any codification of all these implications, despite its central role in the processes of decolonization. Well, you, you, it's interesting because the larger question of the role of self-determination is such a politically hot topic mm -hmm. that maybe it's easier to enter it through the sea level rise uh, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I guess the question is, is entering it that way truly resolve all questions when the changes in the states are not because of sea level yeah. rise, but yeah, for other yeah. reasons. But the intent is not to do that, of course. I mean, the mandate for sea level rise is a very specific issue. You have, uh, it's happening, sea level rise. That's why I said we're, we're, it's going to happen regardless, it's how much. And, and there will be millions of people, billions, impacted. And so the work of the commission is really taking on this massive global, we know it's going to happen, is happening, and actually trying to find legal solutions to it. So in that sense, we had a very specific problem that entails statehood. Now it could lead in to, you know, possibly, what do you call, um, uh, not side effects, but uh, um, offshoots. Um, such as you know, yeah. yeah, you know, of these other issues, um, but I, I wouldn't criticize the commission for for you know, for that. To be honest, <laughs> I mean, I'm 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 not I'm not even criticizing the disagree. commission. It's, it's just that this <laughs> has re it's been on the agenda and it's been a very live yeah. issue, but it's they've scattered around it, um, and it it remains the elephant in the room. Where it it will raise its head in so many other contexts, including on. But, but self determination. I mean, I think that that, and yeah. if you take it just self determination as an issue, it could be problematic. But putting it within the context of sea level rise, uh, you have a lot of support for self determination coming out. So anyway. So before we open it up, so get your questions ready. Um, I guess a, a final kind of a question that comes up here is okay. So we've got the Itlos opinion. And we're anticipating a, a couple more ICJ that directly might affect some of your work. Do you think, how do you think about the ICJ's role here, the ITLAS opinion versus what you've done? Uh, is it totally consistent? Do you think you're going to go back to change anything if the ICJ says something different? What's the relationship between? your work and what those courts might do. So for sea level rise. So um, so on ITLOS, of course, we were both on COSIS together. Uh, um, and, the, and of course, I think it's a fantastic uh, advisory opinion. I don't know if the students, if you read it, but you really should. I mean, it's a, it's a really powerful uh, advisory opinion. Um, but it doesn't say anything about sea level rise. However, um, when you consider that sea level rise is the result of thermal expansion of the ocean, uh, which is because of carbon dioxide and absorption of heat, um, it's very important because it's made clear that states do have an obligation for taking measures mitigation and adaptation. And, mm -hmm. and it's important because that was the first time that um, it lost and the other court has recognized the uh, adaptation um, uh, as part of the obligation, and so mitigation adaptation together for the law of the sea, at least. Now, um, so in so that will help, um, but it doesn't answer the question about you know baselines and islands. On the other hand, do we want the court to really address it at this point um, for the ICJ? The ICJ question is much broader. There's many components to it. Um, and I have mixed feelings about whether the ICJ should actually tackle specifically the issue of maritime boundaries, baselines, because the work we're doing right now, I think, is going the right direction. <laughs> so it may not be the right timing. So they Obviously, should wait for you instead of you waiting for them. Yeah, perhaps, you know, <laughs> uh, perhaps. 
but I'm not sure how much has been raised, really. It's not in the question itself, to be quite honest. So. Well, it turns on what Phoebe will argue, right? Yeah, yeah, what Phoebe, yeah. Phoebe, yeah. what are you going to yeah. do? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to say? I mean, <laughs> yeah. what about I, I'm not going to tell you. I've learned the rules about being hired counsel. You don't say much about what you're ah, going to argue. Ah, you see. But um, <laughs> it depends on what states argue, because, as you know, and, and in some sense, I think the ITLOS judgment has been rightly celebrated for clarifying a number of points. It hasn't gone far enough. And a sense, courts in advisory opinions have to find a middle ground, areas of convergence and divergence between states. So it depends very much on what states argue and what they ask it for. But there are also understandable limits on what courts can do. So the real big questions, which I hope the ICJ maybe will have the courage, or some states will at least argue, uh, questions around challenging questions of responsibility for historic emissions, because that's really one of the big questions. And, and what are the implications for that? And whether or not principles of intertemporal law can give way to considerations of substantive justice. Um, ultimately, it depends on what states clearly argue, what they ask for, and whether their judges will be courageous enough to sort of advance the law further. My worry is if we get a general confirmation of principles on which few of us would disagree with, then we don't take things much further beyond the polarization that has very much characterized the COP processes. But um, we'll wait and see. Okay, so now we have some minutes for questions. Yes, right here. Uh, what is the extent to which members of the commission act as um, agents of the state? As in, what is the wiggle room during negotiations and discussions? And how much is like instruction from the state? Like, does that matter? Or, um, yeah, generally, just what is the extent, basically? Well, I, I'll speak for myself, because I have no idea what, what the other members of the, we, are, we serve in our in the, individual capacity and as independent members of the commission. Um, I have received no instructions from anyone. I have never been asked to take a particular view on any particular topic on the commission's agenda. Um, yeah. But, sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. Um, who knows, maybe there will be a matter which is um, an existential matter for Kenya or in which they would probably call me and in which case I will remind them that I have an obligation to be independent and to act ind independently and not as a representative of a state. So we, do, we are not representatives of states. So in my experience, I have not been asked at all. I yeah. vote for what I, yeah. what I think is right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same for me. I mean, in fact, uh, the Turkish delegation goes out of its way not to, because they're, they're aware of that. Actually, they've said that to me. We respect your independence. Um, one criticism, and you mentioned that earlier, is that the commission has become more government legal advisors, mm. you know, um, but in general, we have a couple of, ex we have an exception, I won't say what, who though, um, we assume that they are operating, you know, independently. Um, so. Well, that notion of, of somebody who served their entire lives uh, for a government ministry whether they can change to right, be an exactly. independent, that applies also to some members of the ICJ, right? Yeah, that have yeah, been appointed absolutely. as well. Yeah. But it's worse because sometimes they are serving members, not just former members. Yeah. We mm. have people who are government legal yeah, advisors government. or government diplomats who would also come to Geneva and also present their government reports in New York. Right. And you kind of wonder how you can maintain this role. So well, and, so and like the, the U.S. Supreme Court, there doesn't seem to be a code of conduct that is enforceable on ICJ judges. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so on the, on the specific topic of sea level rise, do you foresee the whole sea level rise situation maybe opening up that consideration that climate refugees can be considered refugees on international law? And if not, if they continue to be considered internally displaced people, do you think that affected countries can claim support from other states because this is a global issue? Yeah, so that's the, um, the issue of um, uh, uh, protection of persons, displacement. Um, that's my dear colleague, Patricia Gavalotelis, who's been responsible for that. But as you know, we don't, the terminology of climate refugees is 
no longer really used. Um, it's a displacement of persons, um, and the current the current legal international law framework is fragmented. <coughs> it doesn't protect them. So hopefully, um, one of the outcomes of the work of the commission will really be um, to provoke filling that gap. It's it's really there's a lot of mm -hmm. work going out there, but it really needs to be. And I think that's partly also what the commission can do as well. You know, is, is, and I think the sea level rise has done that, raising awareness. So, and that connects to one of the questions, which is after this study group, do you foresee an appointment of a special rapporteur and perhaps even a treaty on an issue like refugees? Yeah. So, yes, we've come to that. Uh, it, it's gone quickly. We've come to the final report. The final consolidated report will be in 2025. So, but let me tell a little bit what's happened in the meantime. So, as I said, when we first started, sea level rise seemed a regional issue, particularly for the Pacific Islands. But now, I, I has really, in, uh, we see in the UN, it's understood that it's truly a global issue. Um, so, it's been taken up by the Security Council under the presidency of Malta. And I think that's the first time that the Commission's ever been represented at the Security Council. Uh, it was our colleague Bogdan. Oresco is now ICJ judge, but he went as ILC member, you know, not in that. And then um, the UN, uh, the former um, president of the General Assembly, decided to have a to take the topic of sea level rise on to the General Assembly. So first they had an informal plenary uh, just on sea level rise, and then September 25th they had a formal high level summit just on sea level rise, only on sea level rise. Um, so the, the topic has really become much more um, prominent throughout, of course you have the Secretary General who went a few years ago to Fiji, I mean, so there's always been that type of um, uh, increased awareness. Now, um, now we've come to where we will be delivering a set of conclusions, there are some areas where we will point out that additional work needs to be done, um, it, and particularly uh, on protection of persons, human rights issues, as you said, migration. Well, the statehood. So these may be, it may be recommended that they be special rapporteurs. It may be recommended that more than topic, one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think so. They're each different topics. It could be recommended that actually the, the topics be taken out outside of the ILC as well. So we don't know really, but what we do know is the work of the study group will end. Um, this will be our last report and we will, you know, retire <laughs> and then see what happens from there. Yeah. Way in the back. Um, thank you both so much for this. I was just wondering why do you think there's a hesitancy from member states to bring issues to you? Like, does that say something about the trust the states have in the commission or like UN in general? Don't they like you? Why don't they bring, <laughs> why don't they bring topics to us? Yeah, yeah like right. for example, you mentioned that the only country to do that was Micronesia. So why does it not happen like more frequently, I guess is my question. I, it's very hard to know, but I think there's competition from other avenues for making lawmaking now. So for instance, the commission I have seen and had adopted on this long-term program work or considered the question of pandemics, it's soon after the pandemics, a treaty on pandemics. And, and there were those who felt, and I think probably rightly, that the commission was the right place, not just because you'd need technical rules on what to do in the event of a pandemic, but to consider how a treaty on pandemic sits within the broad framework of general international law, including human rights obligations, obligations of assistance. And if for no other reason, the commission could at least provide a roadmap to other agencies, the WHO and others within which to negotiate a treaty. But the decision was taken to take that elsewhere, and therefore the commission decides to take a back seat and see how those develop. So there is the question that the other bodies considering these questions, right? Um, and I think it also is a reflection of the politicized nature of, of the GA, 
um, and so you would require a certain degree of consensus to pass this on to a technical body. Um, but I, I think I have no idea, but that's, I think, what meant that very few topics now come to the commission in itself, but I don't know. And the pandemics ended up being a, a huge resolution in the Institut de Droit International. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think also too perhaps um, um, the commission could possibly do more external um, outreach. Uh, outreach, you know, because I more think more of this, you could do a lot. Yeah, of this. a lot more of this. Yeah, we could um, to really, you know, states could use the commission um, more and in different ways as well. As I said, they once reached out on the definition of aggression. Didn't happen actually, but. Um, but they could still, it doesn't always have to be codification per se, it could be providing support uh, as a technical expert body. What does that mean exactly? Well, a specific issue. They could ask the position, the views of the commission on a specific issue. For example, the sixth committee is stuck on you know, certain things, and that's what happened with uh, de uh, defining aggression. Then they can turn to the commission and ask for the views of the commission on that. Yes, right here. Um, thank you for this conversation. Um, I wanted to ask uh, on the sea level rise issue. On the report, it was discussed th the topic of having a list of vulnerable groups or people was discussed, and a concern expressed that if we leave this too broad, then that's up to the discretion of decision makers. Um, I was wondering what you think about that, or if you intend to produce such a list of um, vulnerable persons or, or groups in this context. Thank you. Um, uh, no, no, um, uh, for the work of the commission we would not produce, that was not asked of us, uh, so I don't think we would do that. Um, and any time we engage in lists, it creates problems as well. Look at Juice Cogans. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and also, draft Article 7, <laughs> we had some lists. Yeah. <laughs> Other but questions? Way in the back. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, so you mentioned like sort of this, uh, or like there's this commonly kind of concern that large sort of economically strong and militarily strong states um, will just violate or um, not necessarily abide by certain principles of international law as soon as it doesn't really serve them. So I'm thinking of the 2016 arbitral ru ruling and um, how China has not ab ab abided by that. And also um, the US not being a signatory to um, UNCLOS. And I'm curious how that's affected developments or that shapes developments um, of the IC, uh, ILC's uh, surveys or statutes, and even if it you know, has any relation to what you mentioned, the movement towards soft power law. Well, uh, uh, so it's interesting, I mean, the ILC, I have to say, it, of course, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot of conflict, I mean, and, and the ILC is composed of members from the states uh, who are in you know, <coughs> various disputes. Um, how much does it actually you know, reflect? Sometimes it does, it has, uh, but overall I would say not, not as much. Um, um, it's a technical body, everyone really tries to be collegial, but it has come up. Um, and the response when it does is we are not a political body, you know, uh, uh, and so um, and so try and uh, um, get uh, you know try and I would say uh, navigate uh, through these delicate situations. But yeah, I think I was I was trying to think of your and like the Institute of International Law, we don't set out to be the conscience of the world. Um, so we very much a technical body taking although that in itself is a loaded statement, Jose. Um, um, we take on the technical roles that are assigned to us. But having said that, I don't think we are completely unaffected as international lawyers by everything else that's going on around us, the disregard of rules of international law, especially when we have a mandate implicitly, not just to codification and progressive development, but to promote the rule of law. Um, but we don't have a mandate to comment on those things, except to the extent that it relates to our topics, and maybe in relation to general statements that we may make about general rules uh, of international law. But we try as best, as much as possible, to ensure that our work remains depoliticized, 
um, and within a very technical field. I think there are those who may disagree that maybe we should also have a general role to make public statements on the great events of the day and to act as a conscience of the world. But we don't have a mandate to do that, and there are those who fail if we were, you know, that the GA exists for that very reason. We should not take on that role. Do you have a question? Um, my question is of the report, uh, of the level of disease. I, my, originally, my question was um, why you were not talking uh, mainly on human rights. I think that it's a talk, but as a peripheral talk, for example, when it's stated about the stateless of people, and you talk more of uh, the original baseline of the countries remains the same, it's, it's, that's the discussion. And once a state, always a state. But I'm thinking about uh, that the statelessness should be like the, a primary topic because I don't know if an island disappears, for example, uh, what is the point of uh, the state remaining a state if the people of the country will no longer have like a base to, to be or to uh, fulfill their human rights? And uh, later on, we uh, talk in, the, in this discussion that uh, after this, um, um, like, this uh, topic is uh, finishing. They're going to talk about other topics as human rights, but why is a uh, second step and not like the main priority of the baseline of the system? Um, so, so as I said originally, um, this was a mapping exercise. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that a few years ago, this was really, states were not sure. So the commission, I say that we're not an academic body. So the commission is, um, is very much influenced and directed by you know, the views of states. But having said that, um, it's, these are very big issues. Um, so it's not that they're being ignored, they're being studied. Um, and, and I would say that for the states who may lose the territory, I think it's still important for them to be states. Um, and what was important outcome of the study group and, and also the work of this, the, um, the island states as well is to bring that to the General Assembly, I mean to the uh, to, to states' knowledge. Um, but this is just the beginning. You can't, we can't do everything at once. And you have, so for example, the human rights bodies have not done well. Um, but now there's more attention. So you have other bodies. Uh, there's also my, you know, the International Off Organization of Migration. So there are other bodies as well. But the work of the commission can really provoke more action on their part. So we can't be the fountain of everything. <laughs> there's a limit. Uh, but, uh, but I think that um, um, your point is an important one, absolutely and the work will continue, and hopefully it will be in the right direction, instead of states saying, well, you know, there's no such thing as a climate refugee, right? Or it's not covered by the, by the convention, so nothing we can do. Versus, oh, okay, this is a gap, it's a serious issue, now we must take action. And I think that's really the, one of the uh, advantages of the work of the Commission on, on Sea Level Rise. One last question, sorry, yours, yeah. Thank you very much for actually being able to <laughs> ask the last question. I would like to um, refer to your um, draft principles on protection of environment in armed conflicts, because I have discovered actually uh, recently that it was adopted in 2022, and I wanted to ask whether a war in Ukraine actually was considered, or was, what was the timeline, whether it has been prepared much in advance, and then when war in Ukraine, which is a environmental catastrophe also to the great extent had any was it at you know in terms of timeline was there any reference or uh, you have prepared it actually much in advance and then it just happened or uh, are you actually have you been actually influenced 
by this uh, yeah um, aggression. The timing question. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to answer it because yeah. I've been. You in the commission? Yeah, I was in the commission mm -hmm. for that. Um, I have to say that that, in my view, that uh, topic is one of our successful topics, uh, and it started with Marie Jacobson, um, 2012, I think. So it started some time ago, and then in 2017. Um, uh, Maria Leto, uh, she took it over, and the work was completed um, at the end of the last quinquennium. But I do recall that the the Russian invasion of Ukraine, of course, did come up uh, in the last, but it was at the end. It was at the end, so it did come up. It came up also in our work on peremptory norms, use Kogan's. It was a just the question came, it was, let me tell you, that was a very, uh, probably the most politicized I've ever seen the commission was on that. It came in, you know, it absolutely did. But, I mean, we were not immune to it. Um, but at that point, it had come to the end, um, but it was discussed. But I think, for me, that's one of the successful work of the commission, is that. So, but you may want to have some comments. No, no, I was not in the commission, and I know that Ukraine was not discussed. The topic was effectively completed by the time we had our first meeting of the quinquennium. So, um, but it's clearly, um, obviously, when the reparation commissions and others go on to consider the environmental effect of war, I'm sure they'll be relying on the commission's report. Alas, we've yeah. come to the end. I'm we sure could do this for a couple year. more hours, but we have to stop and thank issue. our guests. <laughs>